Well, happy hot summer days. I love it. Well, I hope you do. So don't complain up to me about the heat. Turn it up is what I say. I, I come alive by degree. So this is a wonderful time of year, at least as far as I'm concerned. We continue in our message series, Resolve, in an Age of Rage, second week out of five weeks, looking at the most pertinent biblical text on the topic of anger. Last fall, I was driving down 460, and as I was driving, a pickup truck came past me so quickly, and I wish I could say with honesty that I always drive the speed limit. That's not true. Sometimes five over, 10 over, it happens. So this guy, I wasn't dragging, he blew my door handles off. And there was a lady in the passing lane, a young lady, and this guy was coming in hot, and she evidently saw him out of her rearview mirror, and she made a move, it was the wrong move, and I thought they both were gonna roll at that moment. So I'm pumping the brakes, sitting back, watching all this that happens, and kind of thanking the Lord that I didn't witness a wreck, and that I was already playing in my mind. I was going to have to pull over the side of the road, check and see what was happening, call 911. I was ready for the worst case scenario. But luckily, uh, in God's providence, that um, there was no wreck. This gentleman, well, we won't call him a gentleman, this man decided that because this young lady had made a mistake, he was going to fly into a rage. And so she pulled over in the non-passing lane. He was in the passing lane, and he got right up on her, and he started leaning his truck into her little car, bringing the door handles like this and then coming back out. And I could obviously not see the woman, but I could almost sense her anxiety as she was rumbling, going down on the rumble strip. And honestly, everything inside of me started feeling citizen's arrest. <laughs> so I thought, what am I going to do? Because honestly, now I'm getting angry. So I take my cell phone. I know you're not supposed to have your cell phone while driving. And I put it on the dashboard and I hit play. And so I'm recording this guy, and then I try to zoom in, take pictures of his license plate. And this continues on and on and on, and finally the guy speeds on past, and I thought, okay, now's my big moment. So I, I pulled up as he finally, I caught up with him. I ran 90 miles an hour too, and I pulled up door handle to door handle with him. And my eyes met him. I know this is not my best moment, okay? Uh, my... <laughs> My eyes met his eyes, and I just held up my cell phone and went, gotcha. <laughs> I'll never, the guy looked back at me, and there was this look of shame, but there was also this profound look of hate. What I would like to do with this message today, resolve in an age of rage, is I think in our culture, if we think we have an anger problem, all we need is a little anger management, and then we're good as new. I think today, Jesus is going to tell us that we're going to need a lot more than anger management to deal with a heart of rage. For that man to treat that, and by the way, when I finally saw the lady, she couldn't have been over 18. I thought the terror that she felt, uh, that here's a guy, middle-aged man in a pickup truck, just pushing her off the road. And I just remember looking at him and seeing his face, his face of shame, but his face of hate. And I thought about that as I was preparing this message this week. 
What must have been going on deep in his heart that he would be able to justify an action like that to someone who was so vulnerable? And I think Jesus would say today, I'm very confident Jesus would say today, that a heart of rage will not be solved with an anger technique, although we'll talk about techniques in future messages. A heart of rage will only be resolved ultimately by an inside-out change accomplished by Jesus himself to remove our rage and to replace it with Christ-like empathy and compassion requires not just our work, but ultimately re require a work of God. And the only other thing I want to say before we look at our text, Matthew 5, 21 through 26, is today I want to elevate motivation. If you think, well, my rage is not that big of a deal. I just had a bad moment. My language of devaluation is, is warranted because of what they've done. That may be your perspective today of your rage, but it is not God's perspective of your rage. He says a heart of rage is connected to a heart of sin that will need the intervention of God to change it. So if you have a Bible today, Let's hear the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, I believe is Jesus' most famous message, his Sermon on the Mount, where he sets forth his grand vision of what he expects of his disciples, and we hear today his words on unjust anger. The first big idea is to move from rage to resolution. We must evaluate the intentions behind unjust anger. Jesus is not con content with looking at just what we do. He wants to look behind what we do to our hearts. Notice verse 21, he says, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, one of the Ten Commandments, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. I want you to underline, at least in your mind, if not in your Bible, subject to judgment. Because when phrases are repeated, they're there for emphasis. Now notice verse 22, verse A. But I tell you, everyone who is angry, the focus is unjust anger here, everyone who is angry with, with his brother will be, underline the phrase, subject to judgment. So there is a judgment not only for murder, there's also a judgment for our unjust anger, the simple message of Jesus. In every civilized society, murder is not tolerated. If you murder, you face punishment. You are subject to judgment. If you murder, you either get, if you're caught and found guilty, a lifetime in prison or as an extended period of time in prison, or you get capital punishment. That is the idea. And so everyone realizes that murder requires some type of judgment for if people are able to be violent and not have consequences, violence indeed increases. These are so foundational to society. But Jesus says, let's look beyond the act of murder to what led to this moment of murdering. And what is behind murder is unjust anger, unresolved rage. No one decides to kill someone by saying, well, you're, you're a pretty pleasant person. You've got skills and, and, and talents. You're making a reasonable contribution to society, so I will end your life. That's not the way it works. The moment of murder appears in a person's heart, or the intentions of murder appears much earlier. Jesus is not content with us, here simply put, Jesus is not just content with us not murdering people. Jesus does not want us to be unjustly angry towards people. 
You say, Rusty, isn't it just enough to not act out? And the answer is, according to Jesus, no. Because Jesus is not just looking at our actions, he's looking at our hearts. I want to just point out pretty simply today that some people can restrain themselves from murdering, and that's good because they're made in the image of God and they're, they have an innate morality given to them by God. But to root out in us unjust anger will require what Jesus asked of us in his most famous sermon, an inside-out change. We must ask God to replace our rage and put in its place uh, his resolve, his compassion, his controlled action uh, due to the injustices of the world. Jesus not, does not just condemn murder here. I want us to hear, and I think as a culture right now, we desperately need to hear the seriousness at which Jesus condemns the valuing language. Notice the second big idea, to move from rage to resolution. We must understand God's condemnation of verbally devaluing other people. Now, this will be upside down if you follow it, because remember, murder, subject to judgment. Unjust anger, subject to ju uh, judgment. We know what the judgment is for murder. It is jail or capital punishment. But the, this, this text answers the question, what is the punishment for a heart that is set on devaluing people. What is the judgment for that? I think Jesus astounds us with his answer. Notice 22 verse, uh, the second part, B. It says, and whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin in the ancient world was similar to our Supreme Court. So it's, it's strange that fool will get you to the highest court in the land, but now watch the intensification of language. But whosoever says, you moron, will be subject to, now no one wants to say this on a Sunday morning, but we are all going to say it, subject to hellfire. Hell fire. Well, that's not a pleasant message. Here is the message of Jesus. What is the ultimate consequence of a person's heart who is set on devaluing people? A person's heart who is set on devaluing people and, and has not allowed God to do an inside-out change? The devaluing heart of a person that is expressed through their mouth is an indication, this is an uncomfortable truth, is an indication that the person may not know God at all. Now, that is a chilling language, that if a person is set on devaluation, that this, is at, this should raise profound spiritual concern that the person has not had the inside-out change that Jesus uh, can provide. You say, Rusty, every time I have a bad moment, does that mean I'm not a Christian? No. But what does it mean? We can't water down Jesus' words until they're utterly meaningless. It does mean this. If the balance of a person's life is devaluing, it should raise profound spiritual concern about their spiritual state. For Jesus says, if this is where your mouth, if this is the way your mouth is talking, then your feet are walking not towards heaven, but towards hell. That's the idea. You say, Rusty, what am I supposed to do today in light of this? Well, what I want to communicate before I move to the more positive section of this message is Jesus doesn't think unresolved anger is a small thing. That devaluing language is a small thing. Jesus says it's a big thing, and it reveals a spiritual cancer in our hearts. 
Now, what am I also not saying? Christians certainly have the responsibility to be principled. I think I'm a very reasonably principled person. I think I have strong convictions from the Bible. I have no problem, even in context where the truths of the Bible would not be welcomed. I would be more than happy to speak them. I would do so in truthfulness and in love to the degree that I am able. So Jesus is not saying and does not model uh, a non-principled person never speaking truth to injustice. Clearly, that's a good use of anger. Anger reminds us that a potential injustice has occurred and that it ought to be spoken to appropriately. But there is a thin line from speaking to injustice appropriately to crossing the line from righteous anger to unrighteous anger, where no longer we speak to the problem, but we begin to devalue the person. It seems in this day that we can almost not separate devaluing a person from speaking to an injustice or a problem. And Jesus says the Christian knows how to speak to the issue and to do so with conviction and compassion, but never flips over from righteous anger to unrighteous anger and starts the language of fool and moron and even worse. You say, I don't think I'm that angry. You know, that's interesting if people think they're not angry because anger, rage bubbles up in devaluation because the ultimate end of rage is murder and murder is the ultimate act of devaluing. You say your life is not worth it. But I just wonder, and maybe you're blameless on this, but I so often hear people gather around in a circle and when they start talking about other people, it's not edification. It's like, can you believe this fool, this moron, this bad decision, this, and I mean the language of devaluation. It's like if you just deleted all the devaluation, there would almost be nothing left of the conversation. And then we sat around and wonder, I wonder why our world is getting so violent. And Jesus says, you're, you're stirring up violence by the way you devalue people. By the way, you say, why do I not have the response? Why don't I have the ability to devalue people? Very simply, because you didn't make people. God created people, and he created them in the image of God, and they have intrinsic dignity and worth because they are God's creation, not your creation, and you don't have the right to speak to them that way because, well, you didn't make them. And so all I want to do today is just kind of wave the flag you're going to need more than anger management to resolve an angry heart. You're going to need the work of God in the person of the Holy Spirit to do an inside-out change to not just root out violence, but to root out devaluation of others in your heart. You say, if that starts happening, if I am no longer someone who devalues people, but I move from devaluation, what do I move to? How do I know that this inside-out change is happening. What is the, how do my actions, new actions, correspond not to a heart of devaluation, but are you ready for it? A heart of reconciliation. There is nothing more exhausting in my whole life, I promise you. As a, you some people say, what do you do as a pastor? And I would say one of my hardest tasks I can't say that. It's, it's on the top five. One of my hardest tasks is trying to help people stay on the same team. I mean, we as humans, I grieve how much the church of Jesus Christ has lost because people couldn't have some level of reconciliation and continue to work for the gospel and for the mission together. I grieve even for our own community, how much community good could happen if people would just learn how to kind of get over themselves for a minute and work together for the good of the community. But this is not the normal way humans operate. Humans, we get mad, we devalue, we distance, and we break fellowship. And we think that's a good thing. And, and there are moments that 
we must distance if certain things are on the line. I'm, but, but there are far more situations where devaluing distance and broken fellowship is not rooted in something good, but rooting in something sinful. And Jesus points out a new way not to devalue, but attempt to work towards reconciliation. I'm going to give you some practicals here on this third point. The third big idea is to move from rage to resolution. We should have a posture of reconciliation, not division. Now notice, notice if you listen, two different illustrations are going to be given in these few verses. Verse 23, so if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother had something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Illustration number one. Illustration number two. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown in prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Two illustrations that give us a new way of operating versus devaluing people. Rather than devaluing people, also I've noticed most of the time when we devalue people, we don't devalue people in front of their face, which is just shameless. If you're going to say it, go find them and tell them in person, in my opinion. I don't think you ought to say it, but at least say it straight. Two illustrations here that Jesus gives. The first illustration has this in vision, in, in mind. Jesus is visioning this. Every year in Israel, a person wherever they lived in Israel had to make a trip from where they lived to Jerusalem. And there at the temple, they had to present a gift. And so they would come to Jerusalem, they would buy uh, a lamb, and they are uh, a dove. You see it many times in the, in the Gospels. And they would present their gift at the temple in Jerusalem. Every single Israelite did this every single year. And it was seen to be a very holy moment, a very important moment. And it was. A, it was probably the highest religious festival that the nation of Israel had, the pilgrimage from where you live to the temple in Jerusalem to offer a gift. This is very high and holy. And Jesus says, as high and holy as it is to make a pilgrimage and to engage in this religious ritual, he says, I'm going to also tell you something that is actually more important than your pilgrimage from where you are to the temple to offer a gift. And here it is. He says, if you are making this pilgrimage, and as you're making the pilgrimage, you remember, now I think this is important because the illustrations are similar but different. The, the one who is the pilgrim remembers not that he has a problem with somebody, but notice I read the text. And there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now, there have been times in my life where I really am okay. I'm at a good place. But I know there's somebody who is not okay with me. I know they are fuming about me. And, and it would be perfectly easy for me to say, well, that's their problem. It's not my problem. Let them deal with it. I don't have any responsibility to deal with it. And Jesus says, no. He says, if you're going to make your gift, first go and try to make an appeal to the offended brother to see if reconciliation is possible. This is your religious duty before offering the gift. Now, I don't think I'm, I'm not old yet. I don't think. I'm getting older. I'm 40. But I've lived long enough to know that when broken relationships happen, sometimes they stay broken. So I'm not painting some overly idealistic rosy picture. But if a relationship is broken and continues to be broken, and I'm aware on this side of heaven that happens, what God is asking of us 
is to replace devaluing language toward the person that the relationship is broken. And as far as we can do it, try to offer some level of reconciliation to the situation. Here's a question that I want to ask. Who has something against you? Who is at odds with you? That God today is saying, I'm glad you came to worship. But God's saying, why don't you go at least try to have a conversation, write a letter, send an email, make a phone call as an act of peacemaking and reconciliation and give up devaluation. I think today's message may get real practical that today God may say at the final amen today, you don't need to go to lunch. You need to think about who is it that you're out of fellowship with that you need to try to bring the relationship back together. And again, the Holy Spirit of God has to lead you on that because we all have different circumstances. Here's the second illustration. So one is, I don't have a problem, they have a problem with me. This situation, the second illustration, I am the problem. Uh, I'm the reason the relationship is broken. The image here, and I'll read it again, Jesus says, reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you'll be thrown in prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. Here's the, here's the illustration. Someone has defaulted on a payment. And in the ancient world, you went to jail. I guess in this world, you still go to jail if you don't pay up over time. Now, what I've noticed is usually when people don't pay their bills or they're in debt and they can't figure out how to get out of debt, very few people call up their creditors and say, let's work something out. This is my situation. That's not the way it goes. Usually I've had church members, I, I don't lend money. If you need money, I'm giving it to you. I'm not lending it. Uh, but some people do lend money. And it's fine to do that. That's your job. And uh, plenty of people have lended money, and then when they don't pay them back, they think, well, it's been a month, it's been another two months, it's been three months, six months, and people have like the avoidance. Like they, they figure out how not to pick up the phone, how not to return the letters, and they distance and distance and distance and distance. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way it should work. In a world where you have committed a wrong, you ought to go and try to make amends as quickly as possible. You know, I, I just, sometimes when I read the Bible, I think, why do I even need to say this? Because it's so simple. And I don't think every message I pre preach is so simple. But the words of Jesus today are so simple, and yet they are almost completely unheard. Jesus is saying, if you don't want a culture of violence, you're going to have to root out devaluing language and deal with your sinful heart. And you're going to have to replace a heart of devaluation with a heart that has an impulse towards reconciliation, which means when people have problems with you, or if you become the problem, that you attempt not to blame or to devalue, but to seek reconciliation and restitution when needs be. Can you imagine for a moment if I could snap my fingers and in every family in Appomattox, in every person in Appomattox County, if just for a day we did that. Could you imagine the world? Be a lot of phone calls being made. Be a lot of apologies being offered. And there'd be a lot of healing that would happen. This is the way to life. 
But if we continue down the path of devaluation, Jesus says, you're not walking the path to life. You're walking the path to hell itself. Because the ultimate place that devalues human life is total separation from God where life becomes totally unmoored. The purpose of my message today is for you to realize you're going to need more than anger management to overcome an angry heart. You need the intervention of God to do an inside-out change. And I just wonder today, with this altar being open, if you would be humble enough to just say, God, I need this inside-out change. I want you to change the impulses of my heart from devaluation to a heart desiring reconciliation. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you need to come and say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. God, by faith, I trust in Jesus. God, come into my heart and change my heart as only you can. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, the altar is open. Come today and trust in Jesus. And then, Christian, who needs your apology? Who needs you to reach out to them so that you can re replace rage with reconciliation? May we today hear and obey the words of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we realize that human situations of brokenness are complex. But God, we also know that your word is clear. And God, that you have pointed us in a direction, a direction not to devalue people, but a direction to attempt to live at peace as much as it depends upon us and to attempt, wherever possible, reconciliation. God, today I pray that there would not just be truths learned, but God, I pray today that there would be truths lived, that some today would leave their gift right where it's at, and they would go and talk to their brother. God, some today who have been not confessing their wrong would attempt to make amends, would attempt to reconcile as quickly as possible with their adversary. And God, as we live in this way, may we be seen to be your children. In Jesus' name, amen.